Well, first of all, uh, thank you for joining us on uh, this discussion on the COVID bump in uh, education technology. My name is Ernesto Pagano and I will be the moderator and I will introduce uh, our panelists in a second. So to get us started, um, in the past couple of years, we have seen dramatic changes uh, uh, in the education landscape and the way we have served educators and caregivers um, be very creative in finding solutions to address the needs of the students. In this context, we've seen a lot of growth across uh, uh, the spectrum of products and services, from digital curriculum, digital assessment, virtual schools, virtual tutoring, and so on. In addition to that, uh, the federal stimulus provides over $100 billion over the next three years for access to broadband, digital products, and services. So this funding obviously provides a lot of opportunities. So today we want to understand what are these opportunities going forward and is the growth sustainable? Especially in light of the fact that the world is going back to in person and what does it mean for digital products and services? We have a great panel today um, with the representation from the investor world as well as the operator world. So let me introduce you to the panelists before we get started. So I'm gonna go from left to right so we have the CEO of Stride, Ryan, um, James Rue. Then we have the head of strategy at uh, Hato Mifflin Harcourt, Maggie Dumont. Then we have uh, the um, managing director at ETS Capital, uh, Strategic Capital, Ralph Taylor-Smith. Then we have Luben, who is an investor with uh, GSV. And then we have Ross Darwin, who is an investor with uh, Our Capital. So let me start with you, James. You are the biggest provider of virtual schooling in the country. And obviously the past two years have been very favorable to you. Do you think we have reached the new normal in terms of mix of uh, students attending virtual schools versus in person? And what kind of indicators do you see that this growth is sustainable? Yeah, I mean, um, well, first of all, uh, I think every indicator and every piece of research points to the fact that this is not a temporary phenomenon. Um, everybody from the New York Times published an article a year ago saying online learning is here to stay. The Washington Post recently published a survey saying that almost 50% of parents want a permanent hybrid solution in their school districts. Almost 80% of parents want choice of some kind. Um, and if you're a parent, I'm not sure who the other 20% are, by the way, uh, but of course, uh, we all, I think, want some choice for our kids. Um, I think that uh, what we see, at least, uh, in our business the demand characteristics for online learning are uh, ex continuing to explode. It doesn't seem to abate at all. Uh, we've seen our, during this past uh, school year, uh, demand actually increase over the previous year and the, previ and the year before that. So, uh, so we just see continued demand for online services. But I think in the marketplace, more importantly, you see uh, places like uh, New York City School District, uh, uh, LAUSD, uh, two of the largest school districts in the country have announced initiatives for online learning programs. And so, uh, and part of it's survival. Uh, you, have to, you have to realize that uh, those two districts as well as many others across the country, they've lost uh, tens of thousands of students during the pandemic and a lot of those families don't want to return. And so what we see is that uh, online learning, by the way, just like any industry that you've seen go through digital, tra digital transformation is absolutely here to stay. Um, I can't think of uh, another industry healthcare, retail, hospitality, car service, that goes towards some digital transformation and later says, nah, I think let's go back to shopping exclusively in malls. You know, so, um, so there's just no demand characteristic that we can see across our business, across the digital landscape of education that would suggest that there's gonna be a reversion to pre-pandemic levels. Uh, and I think that uh, the other point that I would make is that um, when you think about uh, customers, and I think, you know, I, I've been around this uh, conference now for a couple days, and I hear the term learners and students and things like that all over and over, uh, but at the end of the day, those families are customers too. And I think we have to listen to what customers want. And overwhelmingly, customers, families, students, they want digital choice. They don't want to be taught the way they've been taught for the past 150 years. It makes no sense. 
And so I think that just if you listen to the customers and you let the customers and not politicians and regulators and other people, administrators, dictate where we're going to head with education and you actually listen to the customer voice, you're going to find that digital education is here to stay. And uh, what kind of differences do you observe or expect across grades, elementary school, middle school, high school, if any? Yeah, I mean, I think um, obviously there's huge differences in the learner ability or student ability to, um, to, to adapt to digital trends. Uh, but uh, I don't know, for those of you who have young kids, I don't know, I've got a 16-year-old, and since he was five, he's been more digital savvy than I've been. So I mean, I'm not really sure there's a real age difference often. Um, what we see, particularly in grades K through five, you know, and, and you mentioned earlier in your opening remarks that we're sort of getting back to some level of normalcy maybe, but uh, I know all the businesses that I'm aware of, including my own, uh, we're not heading back to the office full time. I know a lot of financial service companies in New York City are because they pay huge rent in one of the most expensive cities in the world, so they feel like they have to get back in those offices, uh, but, uh, but we don't. And most of the companies that I'm around, they're not getting their folks back into the offices full time. And so that has a carry on effect for digital learning. Why? Because parents are at home more. And the ability to be at home, particularly with young kids, I think will propel a lot more digital learning as well. We've seen the homeschool uh, population in this country over the past two years balloon from two million to five million students during the pandemic. So. Uh, and that can't happen without some custodial responsibility in the house. And so I think that we, we absolutely see that uh, all grade levels, including the youngest grade levels, and in our business specifically, we actually see the youngest grade levels have the most traction and the, the highest retention of any grade level, grades K through five, of any grade level has the best stickiness for the customers uh, in online learning. And I think if you're a parent, it actually becomes obvious to you because that's the time in which you can influence your child the most. It's a time when your child talks back to you the least. It's a time when you have the most ability to influence the decisions around their education. And so I think that those uh, characteristics are gonna really, what I think people counterintuitively think that grades K through five are the most likely to get back into the classroom full time. I actually think we're gonna find that's not the case. I think we're going to find exactly the opposite, and the data that we see from the schools that we, we manage uh, support that. Thank you. Maggie, let's uh, turn to you. So what kind of structural changes um, have you seen in the classroom and you think will stick going forward? Do you think that as uh, teachers uh, go back into the classroom, they will revert back to printed worksheets and similar, or do you think they will continue to adopt digital solutions? Yeah, like, like James mentioned, I mean, we certainly believe technology is here to stay and we will not be reverting back. Um, you know, we went from roughly two devices to every student, certainly at the elementary level, to roughly one-to-one -one devices, one-to-one uh, -one in a matter of months, if not weeks. Um, teachers saw the power of what technology can do. It was no longer uh, aspirational, but they're actually seeing that power in the classrooms. Um, so it's here to stay for sure. But we also know that um, technology alone is not sufficient and that it's really, we see it more of a, of a high tech, high touch. When talking to teachers as we have been um, over the past several years, um, as we always do, but what we're hearing over and over again is no surprise, the biggest thing that they missed is being one-to-one -one with the students. And we know that that relationship between the teacher and students is, is number one. That is what will um, create the best learning outcomes for our students. So really, as we think forward, um, what, what we see as, as really um, changing from where we are today is really facilitating that, that human, that high tech, high touch, and what can we do to enable the teacher to facilitate that more. And from the question of, you know, now that we're back in the classroom, are we gonna revert back to more print? Um, you know, the pandemic forced us into one end of the extremes of the spectrum, you know, zero in person, 100% digital, and that, you know, what we're seeing today is more a reversion to what's optimal. You know, optimal is not 100% technology, but it's not an either or. That's really a false choice. What we see is finding the optimal um, 
kind of graceful solution of print and technology, leveraging, there are things technology of course can do better than any print textbook worksheet can do, but there's also a time for print. So it's finding that elegant balance and solution of the two. Um, so that's really where we see going forward. Um, one other thing structurally I'll just mention is an area where, um, you know, technology really is, is changing things um, is in professional development. Um, you know, because of the pandemic and school closures, uh, teacher trainers were not able to be in the classrooms. And so we saw tremendous growth uh, in digitally delivered uh, training. And, and teachers love that. And, you know, the sit in an auditorium for an entire day, pulled out of the classroom, paying for tutors, um, instead is not optimal. What, what's optimal is teachers being able to uh, have just-in-time professional development or um, at the pace and place in which they want to receive it. So that is something structurally we really see continuing. Thank you. And a follow-up question. Um, how do you see core basal curriculum or supplemental curriculum to change? Do you think we will see more of digital-first solutions or do you see the old curriculum more digital? No, absolutely. Um, on the core side, you know, you go back a couple of years and, or several years, and we actually used to publish copyrighted programs that uh, school would implement and it'd say copyright 2012 and that program wouldn't change for six years, which is crazy. Um, so what, you know, technology enables on the core side is we've moved completely away from the copyrighted model and to an ongoing continuous development software model on the core side, and that's totally different. And, and what we see with, you know, the, the incredible um, uptake and usage on the digital side is we're able to leverage the data that we're receiving from the, these programs to make those continual improvements, both from usage, from assessment data. So that's certainly what's happening on the core side. And then on the uh, supplemental adaptive side, what we see is, you know, the teacher has so much to juggle in the classroom, so many different platforms, so many different uh, digital products. We're integrating those and trying to simplify the workflow of the teacher. So that's where we're seeing on the digital uh, supplemental side, adaptive side, is that connection into the core and with services so that it simplifies that workflow for the teacher. Just, just to jump in there, I really like what you're sort of saying about how much work the teacher has. And I think that was sort of the, maybe one of the problems in ed tech before is that, you know, a teacher planning their day is so challenging, trying to integrate a new technology. It just takes so much activation energy. And I think we sort of view COVID as that catalyst. Yeah. Get them over the hump. They had to try new things. First, there was sort of duct tape. Then slowly, they, they sort of figured out what solutions they liked. But it really, it took something sort of dramatic in many cases to sort of just give the teachers the reason that they had to change their lesson plans, et cetera. But now that they've found those solutions, it's not like it's gonna go back. I think um, there may not be a Zoom every day, but snow days, there's no reason that we're not, you know, we're gonna totally shut down schools anymore for, for a week because of a blizzard, right? Um, we have those solutions now, teachers have sort of found them. Exactly. Well, let's uh, shift to the investors. Raf, do you wanna jump in? To add uh, a couple of different sort of nuances to what you've already heard, particularly from uh, James and Maggie. Um, I, I think that, you know, as we all know, the impacts of COVID have really been global, and certainly the, uh, the COVID bump that has emerged from tech has also been global. I mean, we invest, you know, uh, internationally, so not just here in the domestic U.S., and uh, we see all of our companies, not only here in the U.S., but also in, uh, internationally, responding in a very positive way to this sort of uh, COVID challenge. And um, those that are sort of tech oriented uh, towards the marketplace with particular uh, approaches have, um, have generated significant positive benefit. However, I would say though that um, as I talk to a number of business managers across ETS that's cover different markets, they do see some differentiation across the markets. So I think there's some expectation that K-12 uh, might, uh, might not have a, sus I mean, it, it, it is certainly gonna um, continue in terms of uh, the impact of technology, but I think you know, parents want to see kids back in school. And so I think they're gonna have 
different kinds of um, uh, products and services that emerge. Uh, and technology is certainly going to play a role. But certainly, I think there's going to be a, a less of an impact, assuming that uh, COVID recedes. Um, if I go on to the other side, in terms of workforce, I think that's where we expect to see continued, sustained, uh, positive impact of what we're calling the COVID bump here. Uh, because clearly there's been um, uh, a major impact in terms of corporate training and savings, et cetera, and we're gonna expect that to continue. I see higher ed sort of in the middle, where um, you know, certainly there's gonna be more and more focus on uh, uh, sort of blended um, learning, but I think that there's gonna be more sustained focus on sort of distance and remote learning as compared with K-12. I wanna jump back to you, James, because we heard uh, Maggie, Ralph, Ross talk a lot about hybrid. Parents want the kids to go back in the classroom. You were telling us, I think virtual is here to stay. So can you give us a sense of today, what's the mix of students that are attending a virtual school and where do you think, how do you think that will change? And then we will continue with the uh, plan. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's a binary question. You know, I think there's a whole continuum of learning. Uh, here's what I think we see and what we know. Um, one teacher in front of a classroom teaching 30 kids the exact same way doesn't work. There should be no debate about that. Um, how much time that student spends in the classroom in front of that teacher, I think depends. We have, the, the US has a special needs population depending on who you count and how you count it, of upwards of 20% of the student population. Those special needs kids, they have special needs. And you can't put them e as easily in front of the classroom with 30 other kids and expect them to have the same learning outcomes. So we happened in, our, in a lot of the programs that we see that are fully virtual, we see an over-indexing often of special needs kids. Uh, and so that makes sense. When you look at underserved communities, if you go into a school district in an underserved communities, often because of the socioeconomic disadvantages that they're under, guess what? You see. I, I like to say to our investors, and this audience is probably uh, sort of similar to that, is we're often privileged here. So we don't often appreciate what it's like to be in an underserved community and often the challenges that those underserved communities face. And so when you go into those communities and you see a disproportionate number of families in those communities that are abandoning their school districts because as customers, they feel neglected. And so I think that there's not a binary solution to this. I think we have to offer a multitude of solutions. I think, um, and, and all, all the representatives here on this panel are offering great solutions across the spectrum. It's not online learning or in-classroom learning. It's not just one type of hybrid. I think there's gonna be a whole slew of opportunities that we can offer to provide kids with career learning opportunities where we don't, we don't continue this brainwashed approach that every kid has to go to college to be successful. That doesn't work anymore. The $1.6 trillion of debt our, our, uh, our families have are proof of that. One in five adults today still live with, one in five of you still have student debt, apparently. Maybe not this privileged audience. <laughs> so, you know, so we have to find a way to not have a one-size-fits-all solution. And I think that all of the representatives here, I, I think that's what we're all espousing, is that there is no one singular solution. And, and I think from my perspective, at least, what we see in the marketplace is if you talk to 50 different customers, they're all looking at some alternative to what they did pre-pandemic. Now, in some cases, that's offering a fully virtual program. In some cases, that's just offering their kids more freedom to choose the type of learning that they wanna have. So that may be partially hybrid, it might be in a computer lab, it might be you know, all different kinds of implementations. So I, I don't think that we yet know what the best way to do online learning. We certainly don't, we've been doing it for 20 years. And I don't think we know yet. You know, and by the way, I think when Amazon uh, was 10 or 15 years into 
uh, their business. I think today they would tell you, they don't know what um, online retail is going to look like 10 years from now. It's going to continue to evolve. And I think it's our obligation to continue to evolve with it and to push the envelope to help it evolve. And by the way, the experience is going to be frustrating at times. Because as we go through any evolution, any transformation, that experience will not always cater to every need. And so we're going to have to take some time to, I think, let this evolve. But for sure, we're only going in one direction. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, the, the good thing is, you know, with the pandemic, a lot of the rules got broken. And I mean, K-12, for example, early childhood, suddenly, you know, everything that's done after school is online and digitized and, and with you know, tools that really increase the, the outcomes. Everything that's done in school is also augmented and, and kind of improved from what used to be the rule for a long time of the way, you know, it was thought. I think if you're looking more into higher ed and then lifelong learning, certainly all of that is moving online. I mean, I think higher ed in the US has been very broken for a long time with student debt. Um, the solutions that are out there today are just so rich and, and you know, anyone that uh, is graduating from, from high school has really a lot of opportunities how to land a job, how to get into what you want to really be working and, and also to make it much more efficiently than before the pandemic. So I think there's several uh, great dynamics now in place and, and yes, as, as uh, uh, James mentioned, the options are all there. So we have three investors in EdTech on the panel. Let me shift to you one second. You look at many business models and you invest in many companies that are in your portfolio. Which companies in your portfolio, and Luben, let's start with you, then Ross and then Ralph, which companies have outpaced others during COVID in terms of growth? And do you think that this will continue in the next uh, few years? Certainly. I mean, COVID was a great catalyst because it threw 1.6 billion students and teachers into this pool of you need to figure out how to go to school or how to teach. And especially on the teacher side, you know, a lot of these faculty, they, they never thought with digital tools, so they had to figure it out. Clearly, a lot of that will stick. I mean, the genie is out of the bottle, so um, a lot of these solutions are getting adopted and kind of if, are now evolving and, and getting better and better. Um, you know, it's wrong to, to be thinking that kids in the age of 6 through, call it 16 or 18, shouldn't be going to school. Absolutely not. I mean, they need to be going to school because you, you, kind of, you, you cannot lose those natural, um, uh, you know, physical experiences and, and social experiences. But, you know, corporate learning, uh, it makes absolutely no sense to be... <laughs> to be doing things the way they were before the pandemic. And, and certainly there's tremendous uh, opportunity and, and value creation now with lifelong learning, people needing to upskill and reskill because on one hand, AI is disrupting the workforce. On the other hand, COVID disrupted the workforce. Uh, the, pace of the pace of change is accelerating, in, you know, driven by technology. And, and so the, I think the, the more you're going to higher ed and, and lifelong learning, um, everything is, uh, in, in my opinion and, and our opinion for sure, is going to be digital and, and driven by disruptive technologies. Quick follow-up. You mentioned corporate training. Any business model in particular that uh, you see emerging and uh, win in the next years? I mean, it's... It's, it's, it's really a diverse set of solutions. Start, you know, anything from, from short courses to kind of uh, two months of, of kind of MBAs packaged in, in a sprint to real actual MBAs that help you get you know, the job that uh, you wish you would get. Um, I think also for the companies, there's a lot of solutions that help them better identify the skills of certain employees and to make sure that they are uh, staffed in the right um, places. There's certainly a very large skills gap right now in the US, in Europe, all around the world. And, and a lot of corporates, corporations around the world are increasing their focus on spending against that and figuring out how they can fill those jobs without having to, to fire you know, X amount of employees and having to um, hire another X amount of employees, but really to, to do it with the existing employee base. 
Um, so there's, yeah, certainly a lot of opportunities across the board. And, and from our side, I think, you know, sort of just to, to highlight that catalyst point again, I think all across the, the value chain, people sort of had this opportunity to step back. So students took a step back, right? They, they actually got to see what it was like to take an online course. In many cases, they said, hey, I can't do my current extra extracurricular activities, what is it like to take a, a coding course online? And so students were sort of forced to try new things, parents were forced to try new things, HR managers were forced to try new things, and so in, in each of those cases, you know, they were able to sort of see value where, where, where maybe they'd never seen it before, um, or where it was scary to take, you know, it's, it's scary to take the leap and not send your kid to a traditional school and say, I'm going to send them to an online school. But when now they've sort of seen, you know, hey, I, I have to try something, I'm going to tr make this leap, and then they see it working, it sort of, you see, you, you know, they're willing to sort of do that in, in other areas as well. Um, and so it's, it's, I think it's hard to point to a specific, you know, K-12 really accelerated, but, but biz, you know, corporate didn't. Really all parts of the, the value chain sort of saw a leap forward. Where, where we're seeing, I, I don't even want to call it a pullback, there's maybe two areas I'd talk about. So one was there was a, a, fun, a a especially uh, interesting portion at the beginning of COVID where basically ed tech companies were the only companies advertising online because um, you know, people weren't buying, buying clothes to go, you know, go to the office anymore. So all of those companies stopped online advertising. Um, you know, Disneyland stopped online advertising. And so there was a brief period where CACs came way down and that's no longer the case. Um, and so we're seeing sort of a, a reversion there, but that's not about demand, that's just sort of about Facebook and who's willing to, to spend there. Um, and then I think the other interesting place is we're actually, you know, all of our, the companies are sort of continuing to grow really nicely. The, in some cases you'll see, you know, MAUs not grow at quite the same rate as revenue, um, which is sort of counterintuitive, but where sort of a, a solution may have had to have been used every day in school during the pandemic because you couldn't have a field trip, you couldn't have the in-class discussion in the same way. Now it may be used three days a week or two days a week. It's still just as valuable to the teachers as it was during the pandemic, but it just, the usage has shifted. Um, and so that would maybe be like the other area I'd point to that, that we're sort of not seeing continued growth, but um, I think across the board, it, it's, it's sort of continuing. Although as a, as a VC, it's my job to be optimistic like that. So that's sort of how I look at it. Yeah, and uh, I, th I think I'd agree with everything that my colleagues just said. Um, I, I think the three areas that I might sort of highlight and be sort of granular about. Um, so Lubin obviously already mentioned corporate training. I think, and you know, I think that's a key area that we certainly invested in. And we like a lot. Um, I think another is in the upskilling and reskilling sector. I mean, clearly a lot of people have gone through some dislocations. They've had career changes. They've you know had to be out out of the workforce, and so anything that involves upskilling and reskilling, I found to be huge over the last uh, uh, 18 months or so, and I expect that to continue. Um, I think another key area I'll mention is um, digital learning, uh, and this involves everything from you know tools that actually allow people to uh, uh, actually communicate remotely to um, companies that actually have platforms that uh, allow um, um, content and curriculum to actually be put online. Uh, and uh, we've seen uh, a lot of growth in companies uh, in that sector. And then finally, the third sector I'll briefly mention is just technology companies that provide technologies that sort of underlie or underpin sort of remote learning. Uh, everything from uh, identity management companies, I mean, to, you know, how can you sort of prove who's on the other side of that um, keyboard, uh, which is really critical when it comes to um, assessment, to uh, uh, companies focused on, you know, remote proctoring and uh, uh, similar kinds of needs. And so all of those key areas, uh, we've seen tremendous growth, and I expect that to continue. If I could just jump in um, and... Uh agree with all the comments um, that the other panels have made. I think one, one large trend that we're, gonna st we're starting to see already that we're going to continue to see really grow a lot is corporates not requiring a college degree. I think the idea that the college degree is your ticket to entry into a corporate job will start to dissipate. And we're already seeing that. We're seeing a lot of large tech companies uh, have initiatives that are looking for trained workers, and that's the upskilling and the training that these guys are talking about to give people skills and competencies 
and not pieces of paper that say you have a skill and a competency that you may in fact not have. So um, I think that real training uh, and, and skill-based, competency-based learning uh, that's not gonna require a college degree, I think corporates are gonna help drive uh, a shift in hiring so that the four-year college degree, whatever, master's degree, all this stuff, uh, you know, and obviously in some industries it's gonna forever be required. You don't want your doctor you know, get, taking a six-week uh, boot camp course, obviously. But, um, you know, but in a lot of, it, a lot of instances, uh, and we started to do it ourselves, we believe in it so much, um, we now have, uh, from, from nothing, we'll hire you know, a few dozen high school graduates as interns uh, this summer. I think it's a really important thing that a lot of companies are recognizing and coming around to that uh, you don't need that, that four-year college degree for hiring in a lot of jobs. Yeah, I mean, ju just to add something here, so the Google IT certificate from Coursera it has more weight than a Stanford degree if you want to get into Google. And, and that has been one of the most popular courses on Coursera, and that, that's been really disruptive. To, to with the course. same compensation, by the way, and without the debt. You know, so, you know, it's true. No, I think it's, it's a very valid. Strong value proposition. <laughs> I have um, two more questions. We're running out of time, but very quickly uh, to the investors. So personally, I look at many companies. Everybody's online. Everybody's trying to be digital. Many are growing, not many are profitable. So when you look at the most, the, the, what are the criteria you look for when you invest in the digital world? Because there are many companies that five years from now, 10 years from now may not be here. And some that will be big winners. So very quickly, and then I want to go back to um, our operators. What criteria do you look for? Yeah, we, we have our own formula. It's called the five P's, people, product, potential, predictability, and purpose. And you know, certainly in that predictability uh, point, you know, we look at how sustainable is the model, you know, how visible can the growth be. Ideally, we want to invest in, in, in disruptive companies that will require less capital to basically get to critical scale and then accelerate and be self-sustainable. I mean, clearly, over the last five to 10 years, the market was just crazy and, and there was so much money coming into the market. There was never that fear of not being able to raise follow-on capital. So you had the incentive to grow fast at almost any cost and, and you had the capital available. That's obviously changing, especially from what's happened the last eight months in the public market. And that's starting to now to reflect into the private market. So certainly now it's the time where you will see really the, the most sustainable companies with the greatest models that will be able to, to gain disproportionate um, gains in the ecosystem and then ultimately also acquire some of the ones that are struggling. Yeah, I mean, I, oh, sorry. So I think I agree with everything that Lubin just said. Um, I think I would just add a couple of key points that uh, we at least individually tend to focus on. Um, I mean, we're interested in global growth, so we're very interested in companies that sort of have cross-border uh, growth potential, so companies that can really scale in a geographical region um, uh, and, and, and really perhaps scale globally. So that's one sort of key identifier. Um, another is um, really rational valuations, which is increasingly becoming a bit of a challenge in the ed tech space. I mean, valuations are just going up and up and up. Uh, again, things went down a little bit over the last six months or so, but I think that, uh, I mean, in terms of the public valuations, but I think, you know, it's hard to invest at a high level and then sell and still make money. Okay? So we want things that are somewhat rational. Uh, and then thirdly, frankly, just um, solid management teams, you know, CEOs that can pivot, that can deal with challenges, that are um, coach, coachable, uh, and that, uh, you know, that can actually lead. And frankly, you know, I've always found the best CEO to be a CEO who can actually sell. You know, I mean, sales is, is you know, key. And I, I won't harp on all the same business model sort of characteristics that, that these two talked about, but I think one of the, the nice things in education is you really can try to look at the, the sort of tangible outcomes for the company um, and sort of see um, you know, what, what sort of outcomes they're, they're, they're sort of expecting, whether it's you know, increases in retention, um, increases in sort of promotion rate, increases in, in salary of the learners. Um, and we, we sort of believe in the long term, you know, sort of those indicators are going to be really what ends up you know, long term sort of driving, whether it's companies, students, or parents to sort of those companies. And um, if you can sort of really target you know, how, how are they improving those outcomes, that can be a good way to sort of differentiate. Glad to hear the word outcomes. 
Um, we have uh, five minutes left. So Maggie and then uh, uh, we'll go to James. Let's talk about K-12. We talked a lot about the change and how you believe it's going to continue. There are many roadblocks. Like the K-12 system is not uh, famous for being fast moving. And districts in particular are very risk averse. So tell us a little bit about uh, what you've seen um, happening with the districts, how are they changing, and what makes you believe that they will not go back to the old way of doing things? I, I think they can't, frankly. I mean, um, the teachers, students, parents, um, they want to see and, and experience the power that technology can bring to these districts. Um, the teachers, what, what they are facing today with the, you know, a class of 20 to 25 students that are everywhere along that achievement spectrum. There are kids that are two years behind grade level. There are students that need to be challenged. And it's simply too much to, to manage just in a traditional way at the, the front of the classroom. So leveraging technology to help them personalize that instruction, leveraging technology and an integrated platform to help them extend, uh, maximize their capacity to support these students more on a one-to-one -one basis. That's what they need um, and they're craving. And so it's really about what can we do to support these teachers, to support their students in, in extending uh, their capacity um, and, and really making a difference in the lives of these students. So I, I don't think it's a, it's a question of reverting back. I think, uh, you know, Lubin said the genie's out of the bottle. It, it, it's really about how can we do it in the most effective way possible going forward. And, that, and we, we have not come across a district that's saying we want to go back to the way it was. No teacher is saying that. They're facing more and more challenges. They need support and help from us. Yeah, I agree with everything Maggie said. I think, um, you know, just a, a thought about teachers. Um, y you know, teachers are at the heart of student learning. And, um, and I think, unfortunately, right now, all the things that you mentioned, uh, Ernesto, that are roadblocks, they're not just roadblocks for the system or for families. They're roadblocks for teachers as well. And the system isn't necessarily set up well to provide for the things that uh, will enable teachers to succeed in the classroom always. And I think that, um, I, I know uh, Maggie's company is doing amazing things. I know these guys are, are doing great things uh, also that are helping the teachers, enabling the teachers to better do their jobs and take away some of the, whether it's the administrative hassle or the roadblocks, and I think that, um, you know, there's an ecosystem. A school is really an ecosystem of different parts. And, uh, and of course, we need to focus on the students and the customers. The teachers are also part of that, and they're a critical component of that. And I think that um, we really have to implore, generally speaking, I would say our government officials, uh, to, uh, to really change the mindset of how we think about teachers in this country. Because, uh, you know, there's a teacher shortage. I don't know if you're, uh, you know, fully aware of how big of a national teacher shortage we have. But uh, I would implore you to just go to your local school district and ask your school, local school board how bad that shortage is. And they'll tell you in spades. Um, and so we really have to change the way, not just we enable teachers, how we hire them, how we incent them, how we ensure that uh, we have quality teachers, how we, we have to break down some of the barriers. That if you're a teacher that's qualified to teach in California, somehow you're not qualified to teach in North Carolina. Because the students in North Carolina are so much different than the students in California, I guess. You know, so we have to break some down, down some of these barriers and how we think about enabling our teachers and not putting the roadblocks that you mentioned in front of our teachers. And I think it starts with really a lot of our government officials coming to grips with the fact that we really need to enable those teachers. We have a minute left. Before we wrap up, anything else from uh, the investor side? Roadblocks, you feel confident? Get ready for Web3 and the metaverse. <laughs> well, I'm not sure if education will be the front runner on that, <laughs> but you never know. Well, thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks uh, to our panelists for your insight and your time.